We have been out of the Gospel of Mark for two Sundays now, and we're back in it. We're in chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 22 through 30. And they came to Bethsaida. And they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village. And after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and he said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. Then again he laid his hands on his eyes and he looked intently and was restored to begin to, and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he questioned his disciples saying to them, who do people say that I am? They told him saying, John the Baptist and others say Elijah, but others one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. May the Lord bless his reading of his word and our time of studying it together. Let's pray. Our study this morning is at the midway point of Mark's gospel. And what makes that noteworthy is that here in the middle of the book is Peter's great confession, you are the Christ. That is the central doctrine of the church. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, the hope of Israel, the Savior of the world, the Son of God. The importance of that revelation is emphasized by the location of it in the center of Mark's Gospel and suggests that if we miss this truth, we miss everything. It is a fundamental truth of Christianity. So as important as it is, it's not surprising that Peter would make his confession. How could he not? The disciples had witnessed wonders on land and sea, power over the elements, over demons, over disease. No one ever taught like Jesus. He spoke with authority greater than that of the scribes. But then how do we explain this flash of insight, you are the Christ, when shortly before this the disciples were so spiritually dull that Jesus called them blind? He was warning them about the heresy of the Pharisees and Herod. He called their false teaching leaven. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, he said. The disciples took him literally. They thought he was talking about actual leaven and bread. And so Jesus sternly corrected them. Having eyes, do you not see? Are you so blind? How is it that so soon after this rebuke, they see so clearly spiritually? The answer is in the event that Mark records next. One that lies between that failure and this triumph of faith. The miracle of the opening of the blind eyes. That's what we come to now. And it's what only the Lord can do. A miracle that only Mark records. And a miracle that shows how Peter's confession could happen. It is literal proof that Jesus is the Christ, but it also illustrates that those who do not see spiritually will only come to understand when Christ opens their spiritual eyes. The Lord and His disciples had been on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis, Gentile territory. 
Verse 22 begins, and they came to Bethsaida. Well, this is on the northwestern shore. So they were now back among the Jews in Galilee, and they no sooner arrived than people brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. And we don't wonder that they did. Blindness was and still is a scourge in the Middle East. The relentless glare of the sun as well as bad hygiene causes eye disease. Many of Napoleon's soldiers went blind during the Egyptian campaign. Even today, the blind sit along Jaffa Street in Jerusalem or at the Damascus Gate begging. It's a, it's a sad sight. It's hard to imagine living like that. Hard to imagine living in darkness. Jesus was certainly moved by the man's condition, moved by the, the pleas for help that came from the man's friends. He didn't hesitate, which was not unusual. Jesus, as you see through the Gospels, was always quick to help the suffering. But the way he helped in this case was unusual. Normally, he healed the sick publicly, but here he did the opposite. He, he took hold of the man and led him outside the village. Then he spat on his eyes and put his hands on him. Why all of that? What was the reason for isolating the man? And then what was the reason for this unusual method when he could just say the word and the man would be able to see? Well, Mark doesn't explain that, doesn't explain the reasons for all that takes place here, but apparently this is what the man needed to help his faith. He couldn't see, so Jesus did things that he could feel. And take him, taking him away from the people was a way of showing personal attention to him. What all this indicates is that Jesus was not tied to one means whether it is healing the sick or one means in converting souls. Different people and different circumstances call for different approaches. It takes a lot more wisdom to understand that and, and, and know how and what the appropriate response is in a given situation than it does to use one method in every case. And we can apply that to a lot of things. As I, you think about that, I think in parenting. It's much easier just to have a set of rules that apply regardless of the child and who that child is, his or her development. It's easier to do that than, than, than take time to carefully deal with, with each individual where they are. Or the same in giving the gospel. It's easy to just give a tract rather than measure the situation and how that person is to be dealt with. The Lord had wisdom. He was sensitive to every situation, sensitive to each individual he met, and did what was right every time. For whatever reason, this was the right method for this man. He spit on his eyes. He laid his hands on him. Then he asked the man, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, for, they, for I see them like trees walking around. Now that raises the question, what happened? Uh, I'm reminded here of the, the Hubble Space Telescope NASA put in orbit back in 1990. It was a very expensive effort. And it sent back pictures of deep space that were blurry. The mirrors were flawed. It was a complete failure. Fortunately, they fixed that mistake. Now here, the, the Lord gave special attention to this blind man, but when he looked up, everything was blurry. He was still legally blind. This is the only case in which the Lord's healing was not instantaneous. 
but it was no mistake. This was the Lord's way of dealing with this individual. Perhaps he needed to enter into the world of light gradually and have his sight brought into focus in stages. The Lord knew his condition. He knew his need. He knew what would best serve his condition physically and spiritually and best help his faith. So in this way, he gave him sight. And then again, he laid his hands on his eyes and he looked intently and he was restored and began to see everything clearly. The miracle complete, the Lord sent the man home. What the Lord begins, he always finishes and uses the best means to do it. He promises to do that with us. He who began a good work in us will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And this miracle of giving sight to the blind and in the way that he did it is a picture of us spiritually. Every believer in Jesus Christ can sing with John Newton, I once was lost but now am found, was blind but now I see. But we didn't see everything immediately. Conversion is immediate. We go from death to life. We go from con condemned to justified in a moment. But we also enter the new life with a lot of baggage from the old life. Our minds need illumination. We need to learn. We need to be taught the Word of God by the Holy Spirit. We need to grow in our knowledge. That is a lifelong process. In Ephesians chapter 1 of verse 18, Paul prays for the church of Ephesus. He prays for Christians. And his prayer is that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. Now he's praying that for Christians because that is what we need. That is what we always need. We will always need to be enlightened. The Christian life is a life of growth that never ends in this life. We all begin like the man here who first saw people like trees walking about. Our spiritual eyes are not accustomed to the, the new world we have entered. And what that should, should do for us, I think, is to humble us. As uh, J.C. Ryle put it, it should, make us, it should make us distrustful of our own judgment. Early in his book, Isaiah wrote, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Now, in that passage, Isaiah is speaking of unbelievers, unbelieving Israelites. But Christians can become overly self-assured. The, the, the point that Isaiah is making, the warning that he gives applies to all of us. We need to always look out for ourselves. We need to always know that there is a danger in trusting in our own thinking, in our own understanding. We always need to look to the Lord by looking to His Word and to His Word alone as our authority. We are dependent on the Lord. We are dependent on His Word. We are dependent on His power. We're dependent on the Spirit of God to illuminate us. It's only by the power of God in the work of the Holy Spirit that our spiritual eyes are brought into focus and we mature in knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. It is in stages throughout life. That, that's the Holy Spirit's work in sanctification, progressively making us more and more like Christ, progressively uh, expanding the mind of Christ within us until that work is finally complete. It won't be complete in this life. It will be complete when we are with the Lord, when we see Him face to face. In fact, that's what Paul says. That's the experience that he describes in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, 
That's a bit of an arresting statement when you think about it. The Apostle Paul says, now I know in part. Even Paul could say, I don't see everything clearly now. But the day is coming when I will. It's not here. It's there. It's in His presence. And so we all will. Every believer. Like this blind man who was given sight, we will see everything clearly. And we will not only see everything clearly, but we will spend all eternity seeing more and more and more. That's a difficult thought to comprehend, isn't it? There will be no static moments in heaven. The joy of heaven will only increase and increase and increase throughout all eternity. The knowledge, the understanding that we have will only increase throughout all eternity. We will see clearly then and that clear understanding will only expand. That is our hope. And the power of God is the only thing that gives sight, that gives understanding, that gives knowledge now. It gives knowledge and sight to the eyes of our heart. Now in verse 27, the Lord and His disciples move north to Caesarea Philippi where the miracle that occurred in the blind man would occur in the disciples. The miracle they had witnessed wasn't lost on them. The unusual method of it may have caused them to reflect and, and recall Isaiah 35, where Isaiah gave the signs of the Messiah how they would know that the Messiah had come by the things that he did. Isaiah said that when Messiah came, the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, the tongue of the dull will shout for joy. Well, in chapter 7, Jesus healed the deaf mute. And so already they've seen the tongue of the dull, of the dull shout for joy and the, and the deaf have his ears unstopped. And this healing of the blind man was yet another fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. It, it, it was the unimpeachable proof that Jesus is the Messiah. Now the eyes of their heart were about to be opened or, or at least brought into sharper focus. If they had seen Him, seen our Lord like um, a tree walking they would be given clarity in Caesarea Philippi. That's the place Jesus chose for this significant moment. Caesarea Philippi was outside Galilee. It's outside the region of Herod Antipas. It was a Gentile and idolatrous area. The city was located uh, at the source of the Jordan River on the slopes of Mount Hermon overlooking the northern end of the Jordan Valley. Originally the site had been the center of Baal worship during the days of the Canaanites. Later the Greeks conquered this area and they named it Panyas after the god Pan. Today it's known as Banyas according to the Arab pronunciation. But it, it celebrated Pan, the pagan god. It was, uh, he was a nature god. He was worshipped in groves and the place was believed to be the god's birthplace. You can still see carvings of Pan in the side of the mountain where the shrine was. But later Herod the Great built a marble temple there to Augustus Caesar who had given him the town. His son Herod Philip rebuilt it and renamed it in honor of Tiberius Caesar and himself. And so he gave it the name Caesarea Philippi. So it was a very Roman city with a distinctly pagan history and where Caesar was recognized as Lord, where he was worshipped. This was where Jesus asked the disciples who they thought he was. Only a few days earlier when they were crossing the Sea of Galilee, they had exhibited a lot of confusion about His teaching. 
And here he asked them a big question, a far bigger question than they had been asked before. But he began with a leading question in verse 27, asking, who do people say that I am? What was the popular opinion about him? Well, the Lord, of course, knew what people were saying about him. He knew the popular ideas that were circulating among the people. He, he wasn't curious. He wasn't really seeking to be enlightened about anything. He was preparing his disciples for a second question. But first, in verse 28, they answer him that there were a variety of views among the people on who he was. Some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but still others, one of the prophets. Each answer showed a, a high regard for the Lord, a recognition that he was an unusual and good person, and, and so much so that they put him in the company of good and great men, the greatest men that they could think of. He was one of them. Some even describe the Lord as a supernatural person, as, as John the Baptist come back from the dead, or Elijah come down from heaven. But as great as those men were, men filled with the Holy Spirit, they were still only men, sinful men, fallible men, men who who were great men, but men who stood in the shadows as forerunners of Christ, men who, who looked for the coming of Christ, who predicted His coming. Many today would say much the same thing in answering this question of who Jesus is. They would say He's a good teacher, an example. Others would call Him a prophet. There are all kinds of Jesuses today. Today, Everybody honors Jesus you know, in word, but there are all kinds of Jesuses. There's the Mormon Jesus. There's the Jehovah's Witnesses Jesus. There's the Muslim Jesus. The Muslims claim that Jesus is one of their prophets, so they honor him. In fact, I think sometimes they will say, look, we honor him more than the Jews do. Why do you favor the Jews? Well, there's also the Jesus of classical liberalism. All kinds of Jesuses, but for all of the praise and the honor that people give Him today in modern times, what they honor is a, a figure of their own imagination, which is only a finite mortal creature. What is said today is really not much different from what was said about Jesus in His own day which indicated clearly that they didn't understand Him as, as men today don't understand Him as well. So what about the disciples? Did they know who Jesus was? That's what all of this was leading to, and, and that's what He asked them. But who do you say that I am? That, that's what really mattered to Him, what these men thought he was, who they thought he was, which is clear from the original text because of the emphasis that's put on the pronoun you. But you, who do you say that I am? These were his disciples, the men that he had, had chosen to be with him, the men that he had chosen to, to carry the, the good news throughout the world. They were his friends. He wanted to know if they knew him. And so he asked them, but what do you think? Am I a prophet? Or a man come back from the dead? It was a question for all the disciples, but Peter answered, and he answered for all of them. And he answered, no. No, you are much more than that, far more than that. You are the Christ. You're the Messiah. Well, that's what Christ means. I, I, I'm sure you all know that, that it's the Greek word for anointed one. In the Old Testament, it was used of anyone who was anointed with oil. 
like the priests or the kings. They were anointed with oil, which was a symbol of the Holy Spirit, which pictured the fact that they were imbued with the Spirit and given authority to do God's work and given power to do God's work. But this word Christ became the title of a specific person in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 9, for example, speaks of Messiah the Prince. He is the promised ruler to come, the King of Israel. That was Peter's confession. It was bold because by it, Peter, a, a mere fisherman, an uneducated man, perhaps we would even call him a peasant, contradicted the best and the brightest in the land. And what he said, the scribes and Pharisees hated. The authorities hated. They had rejected Jesus as a pretender. And even though he did miracles that they could not explain away, nevertheless they rejected him and rejected him because he rejected their traditions. And so they were in, in a complete conflict with the Lord Jesus, but Peter knew him and declared with absolute certainty that Jesus is the long predicted prince and the prophet greater than Moses, the savior of the nation, the hope of Israel. Now that took courage, which demonstrated that his faith was real. It was living. It acted against the status quo. Peter took the stand that he did, a stand that was not popular among the men who would know, and he took it because he knew it was true. He knew Christ. And he could do nothing but confess that he is the Christ. But the confession he made was really broader than acknowledging Jesus to be the king of Israel. He made his confession in Caesarea Philippi. This was the place the Lord had chosen to ask the question of his disciples. And it was a significant place because it was where Caesar was confessed as Lord and worshipped as a god. It was a place of pagan shrines and Gentile dominion, Gentile rule. It was the seat of Roman power. This is where Peter confessed that Jesus, a homeless Galilean carpenter, was king. And king, not of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles, of the world. But there was more than to his confession than that. Mark gives an abbreviated version. Matthew has the fuller statement of his faith. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now that gives the fuller meaning of the Christ. He is a divine person. Which is what Mark taught as well. That's how he began the gospel. You remember from the very first verse, Jesus. It's about Jesus, Christ, the Son of God. And so the book begins, verse 1, by stating that he is the Son of God. Here in the middle of the book, there is the statement by Peter that he is the Christ, the Son of God. We come to the end of the book, and standing at the foot of the cross, a Roman a centurion would say, this man, truly this man is the Son of God. That's, that's the lesson that we must get as we study the book of Mark. He is the Son of God. But this isn't gospel or New Testament theology alone. It is what the Old Testament prophets spoke of. Isaiah said that his name would be Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And he would have names, Mighty God and Eternal Father, among the numerous names that he has. So here, at the center of Mark's gospel, literally in the middle of the book, is the central truth of the Christian faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. 
What, what that means in uh, theological or doctrinal terms is Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. He is very God of very God, as the church fathers would explain it. Now Peter and the other disciples had not worked all of that out in their minds. It, 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 it may have all been somewhat sketchy in their thinking at this point, but they had the seed of it planted in them and they knew it to be true. In Matthew's account, the Lord praised Peter for his statement of faith. He, he didn't disown it. That's very significant. He didn't say, oh no, Peter, you, you think too highly of me. No, he didn't do that. He, he didn't renounce it. He accepted it as true and said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Praises him for what he's for what he said, for the confession that he made, which is to say that's a true statement. But in praising Peter, he really didn't give him any ground for boasting in himself or in his own insight, in this, this flash of, uh, of knowledge that he had. He doesn't have any basis for, for boasting in that because Jesus then says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, Peter's knowledge was supernaturally revealed to him. He thought it. He believed it. But only because of the sovereign grace of the Lord God. Mark doesn't say that. He gives, as I said, an abbreviated account of this. But that truth was already illustrated in the healing of the blind man that introduces this, this great confession. Just as only the Lord can open blind eyes, only He can open the eyes of the heart. That is the reason that Peter and the others, who could not see a few days before on the Sea of Galilee, had insight here in Caesarea Philippi. God opened their blind eyes. That's important to understand. That's important to believe. Because, first of all, it is true. It is what the Bible teaches. There is none who understands, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3 and verse 11. And Paul is only quoting David from the Psalms. So that's the testimony of the Old Testament. That's the testimony of the New Testament. There is none who understands. It's an absolute statement. In and of yourself, you cannot understand. Truth matters. And one reason it matters is because in some way it affects conduct. And this truth does affect a person's conduct and attitude. It affects his or her spiritual life. Martin Luther understood that. He understood that early in his Christian life. He wrote what was perhaps his most important book early on. His book titled The Bondage of the Will. And there, as you can imagine from the title, is what he's dealing with. that The inability of man. We have no ability in and of ourselves to believe, to understand and to act upon that and come to the Lord. It is all of Him. And he argues that. And he begins by saying, if I do not know these things, that is if I do not know or understand the grace of God, the sovereign grace of God and the inability of man, if I do not know these things I cannot worship, praise, thank or serve God because I shall never know how much I owe to God and how much to myself. I don't know how much he did, how much I did if I don't understand the grace of God. And really, it, it, it may be more than that. In fact, I think it is more than that. If I don't know these things, I will soon believe I owe most everything to myself. Even a fraction of self-approbation, of self-approval, robs God of His glory. And that has an effect upon us spiritually. But also ascribing salvation fully to the Lord. Now understanding the things that, that uh, Luther is speaking about. Understanding the things that Paul speaks about. 
Understanding those things soon puts us in the right place, which is that of complete dependence upon the Lord. Only when we recognize that will we come boldly to the throne of grace and seek help in time of need. And when are we not in a time of need? Even when we're full and healthy and happy, we are in need. In fact, maybe especially then. The prayer of Augur in Proverbs 30 recognized that. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Now that can happen through prosperity. Well, why do we need the Lord? We have everything. Now I don't know that people think that way and say, well, I've got everything, I don't need Him. It's just what happens. We become captured by the good things of life and the prosperity that we enjoy. Prosperity can be a precipice. It can be a danger. In fact, those who are prosperous are really living on the edge or living on a ledge. It's dangerous. We are never in a place where we do not need to be looking to the Lord and seeking His help, looking to Him for the very next breath of life that we take because it's a gift from Him. Well, we do that through prayer. We do that through study. We do that through knowing the Word of God. It's as we, we read the Bible that we come to know these things, that we, we are grounded in truth and have the right perspective on life. It's as we read the Bible that we are sanctified, that we are changed. And it's as we pray that we receive the good things that God has promised to us. And what we receive through all of that is clarity of mind and strength of character. We become more like Christ. We need both of these in the days in which we live, clarity of mind and strength of character. We are today where Peter was in Mark chapter 8 in Caesarea Philippi. It was a little Rome where the emperor and power were worshipped. It was the city of man. And that is where we live. Man today in our world, our culture, our society is exalted above all things. Science, as good as it is, is the modern religion. Materialism is the world view. It is a thoroughly secular age. Everything about today is a denial of the Word of God and the Gospel of Jesus Christ just as everything was in Caesarea Philippi. But that was where Peter and the others made his great confession. And that is what we must do as well. In spite of what we hear, in spite of what we see, we must cling to that central truth of faith. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. That is the only truth that can dispel the darkness that shrouds this world. The only hope for a place without hope. The only message that God the Holy Spirit will use to open blind eyes. So in spite of all that is around us, we must stand firm in it. Someday we will triumph. Now we see in a mirror dimly. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully. That's the hope we have. Now there's other aspects of that hope. Uh, Paul told the Philippians who lived in a thoroughly Roman city that uh, Christ is God. He is equal with the Father. And the day will come, he said, when every knee will bow, believer and non-believer alike, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May God give us the grace in this world, in this society, to stand firm in that confession and proclaim it to others.
Well, who do you say that he is? That's the question that all must ask. The answer of this book is he is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. May he give you the grace to know and believe that if you have not trusted in Christ. Know this, all who believe in him are received by him, given life everlasting, glorious future, and a certain present as well. May God help you to believe, help all of us to stand firm in that confession. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for... <clears throat> The truth that is illustrated here in the, the healing of this blind man, that uh, that's us in and of ourselves. And we who understand, we who believe the, the confession that Peter made, we know it for that very reason, that you've opened up our eyes. You've given the eyes of our, the, uh, uh, of our hearts insight, understanding, clarity. And we still need that. So, Father, please continue to open the eyes of our heart and clarify our understanding and give us firm conviction that we might be bold witnesses in the world in which we live. We thank you for the fact that you, you have promised us to triumph in the end because Christ will. And we are in him by your grace and through faith. So we give you the praise and we give you the thanks for the glorious hope that we have. We pray these things in his name. Amen.